So this is still chapter one, and in this uh, video, we have temperature and density calculations. Um, and just take it slow and keep working on your worksheets as you're going through these calculations. It will really help you. Now let's talk a little bit about the temperature scale. We've talked about the other units where you can convert from uh, one unit to another unit by uh, multiplying by any power of 10. Uh, but the temperature scale is a little bit different, okay? Um, first of all, temperature is a measure of hotness, okay, of something, um, whether something is hotter or cooler. And uh, usually, as you know, heat will flow from higher temperature to a lower temperature. Anyhow, so we have a temperature scale, all right? And there are three units for temperature that we've talked about. One is Celsius. It's also called centigrade. And we have Fahrenheit and Kelvin. And remember, Kelvin is the SI unit. Celsius and Fahrenheit are not SI units. Celsius is used all over the world. And in US, we use Fahrenheit. So we need to be able to convert all of these. Okay. The sad thing about all of these units is that they are very different okay, from each other. So for example, this is a nice figure to show you. Uh, how things are working okay in the different scales so here is Fahrenheit here is Celsius and here is Kelvin okay so look at this over here water freezes at zero degree Celsius we all know that and water freezes at 32 degree Fahrenheit as we know in the US okay is uh, 32 that's the freezing point of water now this number here 273.15 K is actually the zero degree Celsius okay so which means that these numbers are where the water will actually freeze. So you can say they're actually very different. Uh, they're not like, you know, multiples of tens or anything like that, which means that the calculation becomes slightly different, okay? And then here we go with the water boiling. Now in Celsius, it's very easy because the water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. In case of freezing water, the water boils, uh, excuse me, uh, in case of Fahrenheit, the water boils at 212 degree Fahrenheit, whereas in case of Kelvin, uh, the water boils at 373.15. The one thing that is nice about Celsius and Kelvin is that one degree Celsius is also one Kelvin. All right, see here, going from water freezing to water boiling is 100 units. Going from water freezing to water boiling in Kelvin is also 100 units, okay? Which means that Celsius and Kelvin is an equal scale, all right? It may not be the same numbers, but the degrees are the same, okay? Whereas in Fahrenheit, between the water freezing and boiling is 180 uh, degrees, okay, difference. So the 180 is very different from 100, obviously, okay? So which means that there is a different kind of a conversion that we have to use for Fahrenheit to Celsius or to Kelvin. Uh, but Kelvin to Celsius is very easy to do, okay? Because zero Celsius is equal to 273.15 Kelvin, all right? That's how it goes. So looking at all of these units, here are the conversion factors that you're going to use, all right, for this. To convert centigrade into Fahrenheit, you will have to take the, uh, excuse me, to convert Fahrenheit into Celsius, you will have to take the Fahrenheit number, subtract 32 from it, and multiply it by 5 over 9, okay? To convert Celsius into Fahrenheit, this is the formula you're going to use, okay? Which means that Celsius plus 32 times 9 over 5. Going from Kelvin or going from Celsius to Kelvin is very easy because all you have to do is take the Celsius and add 273 to it you can see that there is no direct conversion from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. So if you're given Fahrenheit and you're asked to convert to Kelvin, you have to first go to centigrade and then come to Kelvin. All right, there is no direct conversion from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. All right, but these are the formulas you're going to use. And I will give these formulas to you in the, for the exam, you just have to know how to use them. And so here are some examples of how to do these calculations, okay? So for example, in winter, the average low temperature in interior Alaska is minus 30. And see this dot over here? This is the decimal point. And what this is trying to tell you is that this is two significant figures because if it was just minus 30, it would be one significant figure, okay? So this decimal point here signifies that we have two significant figures. 
Anyhow, continuing on, what is this temperature in Celsius and in Kelvin? All right, so first of all, this is the formula we are going to use for our uh, conversion factor. Okay, so to figure out what we have in centigrade, we need to take what is in Fahrenheit, subtract 32 from it, and then multiply it by 9 divided by 5. So here it is. And remember, this is two significant figures. When you're doing conversions, by the way, these conversion factor significant figures do not matter at all because if you keep looking at those, then you will always come up with either one or two significant figures and that is incorrect, all right? So always look at your data that you're uh, converting. So simple calculation over here, once you do the negative uh, subtract 30 and uh, 32, which is really you're adding those two numbers, you do the calculation and this is what you come up with. So our significant figures that we should have is of course two significant figures, so which means that we have 34, okay? And now what we have to do is convert 34 into Kelvin, that is the second part of our problem. And in this case, things are very easy because all you have to do is take 34 and add 273 to this. Don't mind all of this, don't worry about it because this really is just converting the uh, centigrade to Kelvin, okay? Which is not important. This is the most important part here um, where you take uh, minus 34 and add 273 to it. Okay, all this little portion is doing is converting the centigrade to Kelvin so that you're not really adding centigrade to Kelvin because you can't add two different units. Okay, but we know that one centigrade is equal to one Kelvin. That's the, that's the conversion factor that's given over here. And that is what we did in the previous slide also. Okay, so that's all that is doing. And uh, so here is what we have. And our final answer should be uh, 239.15 Kelvin. 239 Kelvin. Okay, so three significant figures. If you want, you can convert this also into 240 Kelvin. Why? Because this was actually two significant figures. All right. So the final answer. Derived units. Derived units are where you have combination of um, two or more units. Okay. So, so far we've been using, using single units. Derived units are also known as secondary units where you have more than one unit. Okay. So, which means even if you're calculating area, that would be a secondary unit because you have to multiply two units together. For volume, you have to multiply three. Okay, and so meter square, meter cubed, these are all what we call derived units. The ones that you will be using a lot um, for us is density. Okay, we don't calculate area so much, uh, but you might find some calculations. Okay, and so um, these are all called derived units because you have more than one unit, okay, in these cases. So for example, density. Density is a very common thing that we use in um, chemistry. And density is defined by mass per unit volume. So how much mass you have in a certain amount of volume. Okay, so for units, for density, for solids is going to be gram per centimeter cube. So which is mass, mass is grams, and then unit volume is centimeter cube. And for liquids and gases, it's grams per milliliters. Okay, and so, uh, this is how we calculate density. It's a very important factor in, in chemistry. So here is an example okay, of density calculation. Oil of wintergreen is a colorless liquid used as a flavoring. A 28.1 gram sample of oil of wintergreen has a volume of 23.7 milliliters. What is the density of oil? Okay. Uh, this is one of the things that you will have to do in your first lab, by the way, calculate density. So, um, better learn it now. So what we need to do is we need to know um, the mass per unit, which means gram per centimeter cube. Okay, and so the mass is given to us as 28.1 grams. The volume is 23.7 uh, milliliters. The formula for density is mass over volume, as it says here in the units also. Go ahead and plug in all the values. Look at your significant figures. Okay, in this case, we have three sig figs in both cases, which means that our final answer should also be in three significant figures. Always write your units. Once you get this answer, then you have to round it off. Now, remember what I told you? You have to count from the left 
and since we have to get to three significant figures, you should count up to three numbers and then look at the right uh, number. So 1.18 is for sure. And then because five is five or more, then you have to bring it to the left plus one. Okay, and so this becomes 1.19 grams per milliliters. And that's your final answer for density calculation. Regarding the density calculations, the types that you will get, uh, types of problems that you will get is that you might be given the density and asked to calculate mass. You might be given the volume and density uh, or the mass and the density you'll be asked to calculate volume. So any of uh, the two numbers will be given to you and you'll be asked to find out the third one. You should look at my pencast where I have given you some more uh, solved examples for density. Here's another problem. A uh, sample of gans uh, gasoline has a density of 0 0.718 grams per milliliters. What is the volume of 454 grams of gasoline? So mass is given to us and density is given to us. Okay, in this, we're supposed to calculate the volume. Now density is mass over volume. If you do cross multiplication, then you take volume up here and bring density down here. Okay, and so I use cross multiplication quite a lot. And so this is how I would solve uh, for volume, okay, by cross multiplication. So just take volume up there, bring density down here. Make sure you always write your units, okay, because uh, it's an important part and you can also cancel out your units and know that you're on the right path for the calculation. So 454 grams divided by the density, which is 0 0.718 grams per mil cross out the grams, okay, and then milliliters is now one divided by one over milliliter, so which means milliliters goes on the top now, and so you have a volume of 632.31 blah, blah, blah uh, milliliters, okay. Our significant figures over here should be three because both the numbers that are given to us are in three significant figures, so you look at the three sig figs first, and then the fourth one here is less than five, so you drop everything. So which means that the volume is 632 milliliters. What does this mean? Is that the gasoline, which has a mass of 454 grams, actually has a volume of 632 milliliters because the density is 0.718. One of the last parts about calculations and especially converting uh, one number to another is what we call dimensional analysis. Okay, dimensional analysis is a very simple, straightforward way of converting one thing to another, okay, or carrying out calculations, especially calculations that have different units or require you to do a whole number of permutation combinations, okay, and so it's a very systematic way, okay, and I had never done it before, before coming to U.S., that means, and so for me, it was a new thing, and now I find it very useful, okay, it's very simple. Um, if you're used to doing the ratio method for your calculations, you're most welcome to continue doing that. I have no problems with doing ratio method or dimension analysis. Whatever you feel comfortable uh, with, that's what you should do. So long you get the right answer, it doesn't matter to me how you do this, okay? Because both of them is going to lead you to the right answer. Okay, so the best thing to do for dimension analysis is start with what you know, and then sequentially, you use the conversion factors to get to the right answer, okay? So it's really important for you to start with what you know. A lot of times, we are not really given that much data to begin with, so you know you have to start with that number. But if you're given a whole bunch of numbers, then you really have to pick the right number to start with, okay? So in any case, read the problem carefully first, okay? See what information is given to you and what are you being asked for? So are you being asked to convert grams to kilograms or kilograms to milligrams? What are you being asked to convert? So read carefully and then make a strategy for it, okay? And you find the proper equation constant conversion factor. So if you know you have to go from grams to kilograms, then you find out the conversion factor, okay? From that table or of course from your memory. If you're converting from a non-SI unit to an SI unit, then you will need tables, okay? Because uh, I will give you those conversion factors, but remember for SI units, you have to do this yourself, okay? But for non-SI units, I will give you the conversion factors. So get that ready. 
check for all the signs which means you have positive negative check for all the units that are given to you and of course check for significant figures okay because eventually you have to give me the right significant figures and again remember your conversion factors do not count as significant figures only what you're starting with only your data counts as your significant figures and then finally look for the answer okay once you calculate the answer just think about it is it reasonable is it does it look right uh, does it you know in in quantity wise does it look right or not okay so these are some of the common things you have to look for when you're trying to set up your dimension analysis so here is an example okay convert 12 inches to meters all right so which means we're going from one length unit to another length unit inches is a non si factor and meters is an si number okay so we have to first find out what are the uh, conversion factors that we need okay so from our books from the web from wherever um, you find out that in one inch you have 2.54 centimeters and then since we have to go to meters and we are uh, given the conversion from inch to centimeters we need to go from centimeter to meter okay so these are our conversion factors that we will need now remember i will give you the non si conversion factor you need to know the si conversion factor okay all right so now that we know what we need to start with 12 inches is what we are converting so you'll keep 12 inches to begin with then you will set up your problem okay now inches is on the top over here so you need to convert inches into centimeters so inches will go down here centimeters will go on the top over here okay and then since you have to convert centimeters into meters you keep centimeters down here and meters over here the first thing i usually do is set up my units not my numbers okay i'll set up the number for the first one here but these are the numbers they come later on i set up my units first so inch 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 goes down here centimeters goes up here and then i know i have to convert centimeters to meters so i keep centimeters down here and meters on the top okay and then cross out my units so i know i'm left with meters so i know i'm on the right track now for putting in the numbers all i have to do is follow what is in front of these numbers so in front of inch i have one in front of centimeters i have 2.54 so that's what goes over here in case of the si unit i have 100 centimeters so i put 100 in front of centimeters and one in front of the meter so i put one over here if you get this wrong if you say one centimeter is equal to 100 meter then obviously your answer is going to be wrong so i really urge you to know your si units and then of course you set up the calculation once you've done the calculation this is the number you come up with and this is not the right answer or is this yes it is okay why so because you need to have it in four significant figures okay this is three significant figures this is one significant figure but you're not using the conversion factors as your significant figures you're using your data as your significant figures okay so this is then your final answer okay going on to the next problem the food and drug administration recommends that dietary sodium intake be no more than 24 milligrams per day what is this mass in pounds okay and one pound is equal to 453.6 grams which means that even once we convert before we even convert it to pounds we need to convert milligrams into grams okay so that is our strategy going from milligram to gram and then to pound here it is going from milligram to gram to pound okay and so all the conversion factors are given to us because of course we have now memorized that in one gram we have 1000 milligrams and then of course the pound to the gram conversion is already given to us okay so this is your number that you already know this is the conversion factor to convert milligrams into grams and then finally converting grams into pounds okay and so then you cross out the units you make sure you're left with the unit that you know that you need which is pounds and then you do the calculation okay once you do the calculation you will see that actually you will get a larger number or a smaller number um, your significant figures over here should be two these zero zeros will not count remember that okay because there is no decimal point over here so which means that you have to bring it to two significant figures the best way to bring it to a two significant figure answer 
is by converting it into exponents. Okay, so 5.3 times 10 to the negative 3 pounds, okay, is going to be your answer. You can also leave it as 0 0.000, 000 uh, or 0 0.0053, but it's much better to convert it into uh, exponent form, okay? Uh, you should definitely look at uh, the pen casts that I have loaded for you uh, to see all of these calculations in more detail because I have set it up in a very systematic manner for you. Okay, so hopefully you will understand it a little bit more when you're trying to solve this yourself. Your takeaway from this video is calculations for temperature density and setting up dimension analysis. There is one more PowerPoint, not a video, on dimension analysis where I've covered a little bit more problems. Make sure you go through those and see if that helps you.